Well, this one is gonna really upset some folks because just about everybody in the medical and in the natural world as well cannot shut up about the fact that everybody should be taking pounds of vitamin D at a time. Just, just take it all in, all that you can. And the reality is, depending on your body chemistry, too much vitamin D can be just as problematic as not having enough. And the science behind it is going to totally make sense to you. This is gonna freak you out. TC Hill is not a doctor and does not claim to be a doctor or licensed in any type of medical field. Don't be an idiot and use anything heard on the show as medical advice. This information should be used for educational purposes only and you should contact your doctor for any medical advice. Now get off me. Now a lot of this conversation is going to be about the relationship between vitamin D and calcium. Now I'm not telling you to lower any type of dose of vitamin D that your doctor may have told you to do. That's between you and your doctor. I just want to share how the medical world came up with these really high doses of vitamin D because that's what their clinical trials told them. So how this works with a lot of these trials is that they'll check the blood calcium level of a person when they come into the trial because who's going to sign up for, hey, why don't you dig a needle into my bones and check the calcium level there? So they check the blood calcium level and then they administer vitamin D and they come back and check the blood calcium levels again and it goes up. So wow, look at that. This big dose of vitamin D helps us assimilate more calcium and we're having all these diseases of, of calcium problems like osteoporosis and osteopenia and all this other stuff. So look at how vitamin D helps us assimilate all this calcium, so let's just give everybody pounds at a time. The problem is since they've been telling everybody to take all this vitamin D, osteoporosis has been on the rise and it's projected to continue to rise even more. So we need to look at what's going on here. What can be even more important is to understand how this relates to our immune system functioning correctly. We're living in a time where we kind of want our immune system to function the right way. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you here, we've been teaching to the doctors and health professionals that study with us for uh, 10 years or more. And we learned a lot of this by the research of Carrie Reams and, and Dr. Royal Lee. And these were people who kind of really like to look at how nutrition affects the human physiology and how the body functions. We like to learn from looking how the body reacts to this nutrition stuff because just looking at the numbers from a clinical trial can create a lot of confusion. And we're going to get to that in a few minutes when we talk about type 2 diabetics and their vitamin D levels. And if you want to dig deeper into this, a great lecture out there is by Dr. Mark Anderson who kind of talks about a lot of Dr. Royal Lee's research and he explains the, the relationship between calcium and vitamin D in the immune system. And you can find that lecture out there. If I can find a link to it, I'll, I'll put it in the description below. But how it works is that the calcium at the tissue level in our body is really crucial for how the immune system works. There needs to be enough calcium at that tissue level for the body to signal the immune system that, hey, there's a problem. There's an invader. You need to attack and get this invader under control. And when there's not enough calcium at the tissue level, then the body can't signal the immune system. The immune system doesn't really know that there's a problem and the problem can really thrive. So a great example of how this works is when somebody gets a herpes cold sore. Like we know that people get cold sores because they have that herpes virus inside the body all the time. And once you have it, they say it's just kind of always there, but it will stay dormant. And then all of a sudden the person has a cold sore. I'm like, oh man, I got a cold sore again. But what happens is for a wide variety of reasons, too much calcium can get pulled out of the tissues. And then the immune system is no longer being told that there's this invader and the invader, this herpes virus, starts to flower and then they get a breakout of a cold sore. This is why the amino acid lysine is so popular in the, in the herpes community. I don't know, is that a community? But most people that have herpes know that lysine can be very effective at reducing breakouts. And lysine is really good at pushing calcium back down to the tissue level. That's why it's so effective. So it's not just a herpes thing. This is true with any type of invader in the body. We need that calcium to be at the tissue level in order for the immune system to know, okay, there's trouble here that I need to take care of. So here's where vitamin D comes into the picture. Vitamin D helps us pull calcium out of the intestinal tract. So we eat this food and this food has calcium in it. And then the vitamin D helps us pull the calcium out of the intestinal tract into the bloodstream so that we can use it. So it's this big hero. It's like this shop vac that says, hey, I'm going to pull the calcium in so that your body can use this calcium. And then the body can put all the calcium in the right place and the body functions correctly and the immune system functions and vitamin D is this big hero. So we're very grateful for vitamin D and it's very important to understand that vitamin D is necessary for this to happen. If a person doesn't have enough vitamin D, 
they can't pull the calcium into the system and then the calcium can't go down to the tissues and then the immune system doesn't function and there's a whole lot of trouble. This is why you hear vitamin D in the conversation anytime anybody brings up the immune system. It makes sense. It's really necessary. But here's the trouble. And you knew there was going to be trouble, didn't you? When you increase the vitamin D intake to these crazy high levels, that dust buster that was pulling the, the calcium out of the intestinal tract into the bloodstream, it turns into this super turbo shop vac this starts pulling calcium out of the intestinal tract into the bloodstream, but it also starts pulling calcium from everywhere into the bloodstream, even out of the tissues and even out of the bones. So it makes the bloodstream calcium retentive and it pulls the calcium there and it holds it there as long as that vitamin D is really high. And now the calcium can't get down to the tissues where it needs to be for that immune system to function the way that it needs to function. If we stick with the herpes example, this is also why you hear about, oh man, I got a cold sore after I was got a sunburn. You know, I was out in the sun for too long and I got a cold sore. It happens every time. It's one of the most common causes of a breakout. It's because this excess vitamin D that comes from that excessive sun exposure is pulling too much calcium out of the tissues and allowing that virus to flower and create the cold sore. And when I say that too much vitamin D is pulling too much calcium out of the tissues and even the bones, I'm not saying that high vitamin D doses are the cause of osteoporosis, but if you think about how it's working, it's almost like the perfect recipe for magnifying the problem. Now we view the cause of osteoporosis in most cases as poor digestion and an inability to pull nutrients and minerals out of your food. So then the body has to say, well, I still need these nutrients and minerals. So I'm going to get them from somewhere. Oh, I'll just pull them out of these tissues and maybe I'll even break down these bones to pull minerals out of there so I can have the minerals to carry out the functions that I need to carry out. But that's a different story. You can check the description to see if we have a, our osteoporosis video out yet and we'll dig deeper into that topic. But I just want you to understand that just because I'm saying that vitamin D can pull out of it, I don't want you to think that's the cause of all osteoporosis. But this can magnify a lot of other problems like, you know, charley horse cramps and menstrual cramps and how about a, those people who just like, I get a cold no matter what. Like if I just talk to somebody on the phone that was sick, then I catch their cold just because I talked to them on the phone. So when these people seem to be really immunocompromised and they catch every single cold, a lot of times it's just because the immune system doesn't know that the problem is there. We really need the calcium at the tissue level for everything to function the way that it's supposed to function. So here's something that you can look at yourself at home. You know, we hear all this trouble that can come about from, you know, too much calcium in the bloodstream. And then what happens is the body tries to pee some of that out because too much calcium in the bloodstream can create a lot of problems. The body doesn't want that. So we'll say, hey, I'm going to pee some of this out. And then peeing out all the calcium creates these kidney stones and, and we don't want that either. But even before that happens, you can get some pH urinalysis uh, strips at most health food stores or on Amazon or something. And you can check your urine pH at least two hours after a meal. And if your urine pH is 6.3 or higher, that's a really strong indication that you may be taking too much vitamin D. Now there's other things that can make urine pH go high, but Carrie Reams told us that if urine pH is over 6.3, that's a really strong sign the person is peeing out too much calcium. This calcium is alkaline and it's alkalizing the pH of the urine. And that's telling us that the body is trying to get rid of this calcium. It's too much of a problem. And in that situation, the person should stop vitamin D until that urine pH comes down. And that's what Carrie Reams believed. And in our practice, we find that that seems to be accurate. And that if you can just reduce the vitamin D intake, that that urine pH can come down and indicate that the body's not trying to deal with this emergency that it's looking at. It's trying to get rid of all this excess calcium and it will stop peeing it out. And a lot of this confusion comes from the fact that these high levels of vitamin D can really improve a wide variety of health issues out there. You know, things like depression and anxiety. And a lot of these things that we see with people with low blood pressure, where there's not enough minerals in the system for signals to travel from the body to the brain and the brain back to the body. And we see this a lot with really low blood pressure. But when you up vitamin D intake, now the vitamin D is pulling all this calcium from everywhere into the bloodstream and that calcium thickens up the blood and raises the pressure needed to push that through the system. So it raises the blood pressure, allows the person to function a little bit better, and they feel like a human being. Holy mackerel, I, I'm awesome. I feel like a human. I'm going to keep taking vitamin D forever. The problem is these great results are often coming with a price where a lot of that calcium, you know, the vitamin D may be helping more, pull more calcium into the system, but it's also pulling out calcium from where it needs to be. 
and that's going to create some problems down the road. In my opinion, is this can be one of the biggest dangers of vitamin D for a lot of folks. If somebody already has high blood pressure and then they start taking a lot of vitamin D that's pulling all of this calcium into the bloodstream, well, that calcium thickens up the blood and it's going to raise the pressure needed to push it through the system. You know, what would be easier to move through the system? You know, like red wine or pancake syrup? Pancake syrup is going to take a lot of pressure to push it through the system. So if you have high blood pressure and you don't understand what's going on with there, we'll put a link in the description below uh, of our video explaining the most common underlying causes of high blood pressure. But when the blood is thick and raising the pressure, adding more minerals in there, like calcium, is going to thicken it up more and raise that blood pressure further. And what about the folks that say, oh, well, my blood test said that my vitamin D was really low, so that must be a problem. And this is where we're kind of looking at clinical trials and we're just looking at the numbers and it can be a little bit dangerous to just look at the numbers and not interpret what they're actually telling us. Because with type 2 diabetics, we see very low vitamin D levels almost across the board. And so they're like, well, look, all these type 2 diabetics have low vitamin D levels. So you should all take vitamin D unless you want to be a type 2 diabetic. Look at all the low levels here. Do you want to be like them? No, cram it all in your body. But here's what happens. Just like vitamin D can pull calcium out of the tissue, so can sugar. When you eat a lot of sugar and carbohydrates, then that calcium will follow sugar. Just like you followed the ice cream truck when you were nine. Can you blame the calcium? So when we eat all these carbohydrates and sugars, it pulls a lot of that calcium out of the tissues and now we don't have enough calcium in the tissues and the immune system can't function and a lot of other problems come about. Keep in mind that when we're pulling all this calcium, now the body's like, oh, I gotta try and get rid of this calcium. This is a really big problem for me. So doesn't it make more sense that when the blood sugar is always high, and we know that type 2 diabetics always have high blood sugar because the body's not processing those carbohydrates correctly. So it's almost like they're eating carbohydrates and sugar nonstop even when they're not. And when, when this blood sugar is high all the time, they're going to be pulling a lot of the calcium out of that tissue. So doesn't it make sense that the body would say, hey, well, I'm going to take some steps to correct the problem that this is creating. I'm going to reduce vitamin D production so that there's not vitamin D pulling calcium out of the tissues and all this sugar pulling calcium out of the tissues. I'm not going to have any calcium in the tissues. Things aren't going to work correctly. So I'll just restrict this vitamin D production while this sugar is high. And then once the sugar comes down, then I'll go back to making more vitamin D. But the sugar never comes down because people keep cramming all this processed junk in their system and keeping that blood sugar high, pushing themselves more insulin resistant and more towards that type 2 diabetes situation. So doesn't this make sense that of course we would see the vitamin D levels low if the body was trying to correct that issue? But we kind of think, ah, Mother Nature's probably stupid. We'll just cram more in there anyways. Who cares if, if the body was trying to fix the problem on its own? We're going to go ahead and do what we think is right. So here's some steps that you can take to kind of mitigate some of these issues. If you're going to take vitamin D in a higher dose and you feel like that's appropriate for you, you can also take some supplements that will help push that calcium back down to the tissue level so that it's not all getting pulled out. So lysine, that amino acid that we talked about, that can be very beneficial and helpful. Another thing is omega-3 fatty acids. They seem to push calcium back down to that tissue level. But we're not a big fan of everybody using a lot of omega-3s like everybody else talks about. The reality is that too much omega-3s can push a person more insulin resistant. So if you don't know about that, we'll put a video in the description below about who should stop taking omega-3s. But that is one possible use. And also a lot of people talk about that you need to take vitamin K2 when you're taking vitamin D. That's very popular for people to say now. And there seems to be some validity to that. It seems that the vitamin K2 can help push that calcium back down to the tissues and especially into the bones where we really want it to be for that bone strength. But the research on this is a little back and forth. You see like, oh, it, it's, it's not going to cause any blood clotting problems. But then there's other people saying, yeah, but don't take it if you're on blood thinners and you have blood clotting problems. So we're not real certain yet. But... I do see a lot of people taking vitamin K2 with success. Even when they're taking high levels of vitamin D, they don't seem to have a lot of the problems that we're seeing with high uh, levels of vitamin D. So some K2 may be appropriate. 
I don't like to use a lot of it just in case it is going to create some clotting problems and we just don't understand that yet, but it is a good tool if you're going to use higher doses of vitamin D. But the best thing to keep in mind is that if your blood pressure or your blood sugar or your urine pH are too high, and not everybody will have all those too high, a person might just show one of those going high, but if any of those are too high, you might want to think about reducing your vitamin D intake until you can correct those problems. Or if you're dealing with symptoms of, of too much vitamin D, whether that be charley horses or you know no immune function, you seem to be catching all the colds, or maybe your menstrual cramps are really bad, you know those are all signs of too much calcium being pulled out of the tissues. So if you're dealing with any of those issues, you may also want to reduce your vitamin D intake. And if you need to understand better how to look at your unique bioindividuality, my book Kick Your Fat in the Nuts walks you through how to do simple self-tests at home that you can do with, with tools you pick up at a pharmacy or a health food store. And the book is available on Amazon, but I'll put a link in the description below this video where you can get the whole thing totally for free. And then that'll help walk you through that process of monitoring your unique bioindividuality. It's really not about taking you know, supplements and things that, are, that are all the cool kids are taking or just taking it for a remedy for a specific symptom. You really want to take what's right for you and your body chemistry. But some other things to think about when you're taking vitamin D is that in order for the body to process vitamin D correctly, it needs some magnesium. So if you're not taking any magnesium, you could be depleting magnesium when you're using such high levels of vitamin D. And I don't feel like people should take a lot of magnesium because it can be problematic for some people, but there's not a lot of magnesium in our food supply anymore. So if you're not using some and you're using vitamin D, you may want to take a little bit. And the other thing to think about is that vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So when you're taking vitamin D, you really want to take it with some fats so that you can assimilate it correctly. And another reason that someone might have low vitamin D on their blood test is maybe they're not assimilating fat soluble vitamins very well. This is very common when someone doesn't have their bile flowing correctly. And bile helps us emulsify or break down our dietary fats. And it's really common for someone's bile to become too thick and sticky to flow correctly and they and they might not even know it. So if you feel like that might be a problem for you, then jump over and watch our video on 10 signs of poor bile flow so you can make sure that your bile is flowing okay. But the main thing to keep in mind is to look at your unique chemistry to see the level of vitamin D that you should be taking instead of just listening to what the cool kids say. I can't wait to hear about your results.